Have you considered how the ETFs might uh, fail as a financial instrument? If an ETF corrupts Bitcoin, then Bitcoin was never the sound money that we thought it is. Early on, when I was in school, I discovered a writing as the only real opportunity for me to express myself. When I was a young kid, my speech was horrendous and I had a, a really hard time communicating anything with, with anybody. I feel honestly a privileged like uh, to be able to express myself so coherently and so uh, fully on these uh, YouTube videos. The cost of freedom is like danger and it's the, the constant threat of at a very basic level uh, your life is at stake. If you're living alone in the woods somewhere and you rely on nobody, nobody can control you, you have to feed yourself. There are no grocery stores for you to do anything. If you do not kill an animal or uh, forage a food somehow, you die. The real freedom is to just be a present and to be at one with what with that's happening around you. I love Bitcoin. I wear this hat every day in hopes that somebody uh, sees it and asks me about it. And I'm afraid of the ETF more than anything else. Um, you wrote me uh, really nice comments on my uh, podcast and you're the first one that I brought now on the podcast just from the YouTube comments. I brought on a lot of people from Twitter comments that I get, uh, but now actually also someone from, from my YouTube comments because you give like insightful like S such comments like usually my comments are like two three sentences maybe and you're like giving that and i, I really enjoyed always uh reading them and so i was like hey if you want to do a podcast uh let's come on and then i asked you and and you agreed on that and uh, I'm, i'm i'm loving that i can even give subscribers that are commenting on my podcast a, a stage and, and and interact with them so welcome to the podcast and and i'm i'm happy to to host you here Thank you very much. I appreciate it uh, for sure. Um, you know, I'm a little bit older, and uh, when uh, YouTube first uh, started, there were a uh, long comments everywhere. Everybody just wanted to uh, be heard, and everybody wanted to express themselves and their opinions on things. So it was not uncommon uh, at all uh, to see really long. Uh, Uh, comments and like really long conversations too that, that would go on and on for a few days sometimes that, that, that was happenstance uh you know uh, 15 years ago uh, uh 10 years ago and and uh i think that the the uh, technology of t uh, today has uh rendered people less uh interested in a, a long form of writing and everything is all about like short a pithy uh, Reddit style uh, comments or t a Twitter style where you just sort of like hop in there and jab somebody and then hop out. You know, I think that a writing isn't an opportunity for us to uh, not only explain ourselves and uh, like elaborate more deeply uh, than we can through uh, uh, verbally, but it's also an opportunity for us to understand our own thoughts more because as you write something you have to you have to explore your own understanding of it in order to really communicate it appropriately and as you write something it's a a proof and as you get into it it's easy to see wait a minute i'm full of shit or well, wait a minute, I don't understand this completely. Or, you know, that, it doesn't make any sense. When you're speaking, it's a lot easier to uh, fool yourself into uh, believing like you know what you're t uh, talking about. And so I've always, I've always preferred uh, writing. But that, you know, that initially came from the idea that like, I grew up with a, a speech a disorder that is, you know, obvious for anybody listening right now. And, and um, every time I th th communicate with somebody new, I always like to advertise um, and explain, like, I have a speech disorder. I make a funny faces sometimes. Sometimes I get a held up on a word or two. Um, there's a lot of uh, mouth movements that you're not going to see with other people. Um, and like, 
I've had that uh, my whole life. It's, it comes from a childhood, a trauma and that sort of thing. So early on when I was in school, I, you know, I did, discovered a writing as the only real opportunity for me to express myself. Um, when I was, when I was a young kid, it was, uh, my speech was horrendous and I had a, a really hard time communicating anything with, with anybody. I d didn't have a lot of friends growing up and I was sort of in a, my own a bubble. And so I, re I read a lot of books and I, I wrote a lot and that was how I, I was able to clarify my thoughts and express myself and all that. So when I leave a YouTube comment, it's after years and years of, of uh, feeling like a writing was the only way for me to express myself. And so I feel now, um, I feel honestly a privileged, like uh, to be able to express myself so coherently and so uh, fully on these uh, YouTube videos, you know, or, or, or in any sort of a uh, format, because I, re I remember a time when expressing myself was impossible, you know? So anytime I have an opportunity to, I uh, tell somebody else like, Hey, you're doing an awesome job at this. I'm like, I'm imp oppressed with this. I like to take that, uh, that opportunity. Yeah. And it's, it's, uh, really fascinating because I could see through the comment that there's a person that actually deeply thinks about stuff. Like when, when you see the comment, you're like, okay, he just like wants to, like, there are a lot of different types of comments. There's the, the short supporter style of comments that I really appreciate. It's like, Hey Robin, thanks. Uh, they are like commenting on almost every video. They're just dropping a comment to support their algorithms. And I really appreciate that kind of effort. Uh, then there are the few types that saw the thumbnail and title and they did not like the thumbnail and title, did not watch the video and just coming in. And as you said, like quickly stabbing in, going out <laughs> and then making like some, some hateful thing. Uh, I, I try to like, uh, react with, with kindness, uh, or not at all, uh, to those sounds of, of comments, because they probably also come from a, from a hard time. They also come from a, from a bad place. Uh, so, and I don't want to contribute to, 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 to their, a bad place even more. Uh, so I just like try to be, be kind and, and be loving with, with them. I think that, like that's uh, the best strategy with them. And then there are other comments that are like really long uh, as yours, where you can actually read you and like, Oh shit, he actually listened to the whole podcast and he actually thought about, uh, what's, uh, additionally to the uh, video may be important or maybe, uh, can actually lead to, to some, some bigger conversations. And that's why. I was only on Twitter before this year. Uh, on Twitter, I was used to those small comments. Like there's rarely a long comment because for, first of all, like, you have to have the Twitter subscription. You have to pay for in, even being uh, able to like read, re, uh, write really long things. Otherwise you're constrained with the, I think 360 characters. Uh, and uh, if you want to on, on YouTube, I discovered there are really long comments also. And not as much as in the early days. I, I don't want was on the early days on YouTube that much on because I was so 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 tiny and so so young uh, back there. Uh, but yeah, I, I lived on YouTube now since like uh, at least like six seven years. I'm like really long always on 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 YouTube. And I'm a big believer in giving every everyone a stage. Like that's why I I didn't like I did not knew you at all. I just like saw saw one beef. Uh, and he's like giving those those insights, and I was like, "Hey, let's let's write him." And uh, hey, want to be on a podcast? Then you wrote me on, on Twitter, and then we kind of came into this conversation. And and and, it, and I think it turns out to be a great uh, a, a podcast. And yeah, it's it's, uh, it's it's there like before we start in, in all those topics. But is there a reason behind that sovereign beef uh, 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 handle that you use? Uh, I'm just a meathead. I've been uh, lifting weights since I was like a uh, 14. Um, and I just always been sort of a meathead. Um, I'm a, a blue collar guy. Um, you know, I come from a humble 
of beginnings, I suppose. And uh, I just liked, to, you know, when I was a younger, I uh, I just liked to I read books and I lift weights. And um, I think for uh, for my appearance, um, I don't think a lot of people would assume that I uh, read books, but they would assume I lift weights, and they would just view me as sort of a meathead. Um, and I I don't mind that at all because it it I, gives me the opportunity to uh, uh, surprise people i think and um i always like when somebody's like oh you're not as dumb as i thought you were <laughs> and um uh you're a lot more interesting than you appear to be and uh so i just like to a uh, play on that and obviously sovereignty is um is a thing that i didn't th think about at all until I got into a Bitcoin, but now it's something I think about all the time and it's something that I seek. And uh, I think I think understanding that a sovereignty is not a binary. It's that it's not that you're you're either sovereign or you're not, but rather it's it's it, there's a matrix of it. And on land is absolute. Uh, it's 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 within the uh, the a uh, freedom scale and on a uh, one end of it is is absolute s a sovereignty and on the, the other end of it is absolute a uh, slavery and so somewhere in between there is where everybody lies because no matter what you do you you, you can't be absolutely sovereign and also no matter what you do you can't be an absolute slave to somebody either because you, you will always have the the power of a choice no matter what and so I think like exploring sovereignty and, and uh, it, you know, I, th I think about these ideas all the time because um, I know you mentioned, um, you know, this is somebody who obviously thinks about things. And the reason for that is because I'm, I'm a, a machine operator. So I'm, I'm alone in a machine for about uh, 10 hours a day um almost every day now you know i i can work a 90 100 hour weeks um i'm not i'm not always there all the time but but it's it's not uncommon for me to have a 50 60 hours alone in a machine every week and so i can do either a lot of podcasts a lot of audiobooks uh sometimes i'll listen to a music but honestly there's there's uh, many hours where I have no headphones on and and it's uh, just me and I'm uh, performing um, a job that's pretty uh, monotonous and I can I can separate my uh, thoughts uh, from uh, my actions and I can just th I think about things and I realize that that is not a a luxury that uh, most people have uh, uh, most people have to get up and go to work and start their day and they have to interact with people and they always have to kind of be be engaged in the world around them and i don't have to um for a long stretches of time and the ability to think on things for hours and hours without interruption allows you to really start to examine things in a way that uh, prior to this, I never did. I never had the opportunity to. I never thought to like ask things like, "What is a, a sovereignty?" and 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 what are the ends of a freedom and 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 th th things like a value and things like a money. What is a money? Is a question I ask all the time. And I also ask the a value question. I'm asking myself these things all the time because. I don't think that you answer these things. You just explore them over and over and over again. And uh, your viewpoint on all this stuff changes all the time. Do, do you think that um, because you have that speech disorder and because uh, you work in, in a job where you can actually long think uh, that you are like more into writing stuff? Because I think people that write a lot are more 
um, thoughtful that people that don't write a lot. I unfortunately don't write enough. <laughs> I, I want to write more. And I think uh, I could improve a lot on my thoughtfulness and a lot on, on my thinking in general when I write more. Uh, and in that way, uh, do you think that like that leads you to like coming to such an early place where you're in Bitcoin? Because we're really early in Bitcoin. When you see how many people actually have Bitcoin, uh, that's a really small number. And yesterday I heard the number, how many Bitcoiners have a hardware wallet, for example, how many people actually understand Bitcoin. And it's like 2%, 2% of Bitcoiners have a hardware wallet. And I would say like most of the people that have a hardware wallet and have the Bitcoin on, 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 on their hardware wallet, at least understand Bitcoin to a, a good amount, not everyone that has a hardware wallet and Bitcoin understands Bitcoin to a full amount. Nobody understands it to a full amount, but uh, you, mean, you know what I mean. Um, do, do you do you think that like that all led to you like actually being one of those really early uh, Bitcoin adopters? I think so. Yeah. I mean, I, I stumbled upon it, you know, I should be honest with you. My first, um, I mean, to, like to, to answer that really like a writing allows me to export things absolutely, but I don't get to write as much as I want to just because I, I'm I'm operating a machine all day long. But um, in my spare time, I love to, uh, to write and I do, do so every day. I write down my goals every day. I, I journal every day and then I write a uh, novels too. So I'm I'm always outlining a story for a new book. And that's like, that's a hobby or a passion of mine that I've always had. And that, you know, eventually when I'm, when I'm uh, retired and, and I have time to sit down to uh, write every day, I will do that. But I think that my, my introduction to Bitcoin was not, I, I, I first used Bitcoin in 2015. And it was um, at the time I, I I only only viewed it as a P two P a service. It was it was a technology that allowed me to send a funds uh, across time and space, and that was it. And and it's it's a funny now that you know it's considered such a good store of value now, and and obviously with more adoption, we we want this to become the ultimate store of value, obviously. But my first introduction to Bitcoin was like, do not hold this thing because it's so volatile that, and I experienced it myself where I would, I would, I would put money into a, a wallet and I would go to send that and I wouldn't have enough to complete the transaction within a few seconds because the the price had dropped so significantly that it was like I had to I'd put more money on so I was you know I would I use it and send money buy things online um and just uh and it, it, I didn't I think about it again and it, it, it I, 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 I wasn't until 2020 where I was like oh so it's starting to get valuable now. I got I got wrecked in uh, 2017. So the, the end of 2017, I got I. So I had some I left over in a wallet, um, and I was just kind of sitting there. And then then the price hit twenty thousand for the first time. Or it was on the way up there. I checked it and I thought, oh wow, I got a few hundred dollars in here now, and I I only kept a few dollars in there. And uh, I got like a FOMO, a fever. I had no experience with investing whatsoever. And I bought at like 19,000. And uh, it was not long after that, that I saw everything sliding down. So I, I sold 13,000. And after that, I, I had this sort of like, well, I'm not doing that again. And it was like this like thing. And, and I think a lot of people have experiences like that their first experience is to a fomo in and then i'll lose all their money or lose some of their money and then to 
a back away from it. And then they go and tell everybody that they can that a Bitcoin sucks and it's a scam and they're going to lose all their money in it. And then after a few years, hopefully they come back like I did and start to explore things more. Uh, I love that story. And I think uh, a lot of people resonate with that story. Uh, they get in, they get out, they, they, they see the, the price run up and, and, and price run down and uh, they get humbled by it. I just today I released a video uh, how I got humbled by Bitcoin because I said for three years straight that Bitcoin is a scam. Uh, which is obviously wasn't, but uh, I had three years that opinion and sometimes I just ran out of arguments and I actually uh, discovered it myself. Um, when when you talk about sovereignty, uh, it was really interesting for me to how you explain like, okay, there's slavery and there's sovereignty uh, and everyone is kind of in between there somewhere. Um, how do you define full absolute sovereignty? Like how is like the how would you say is like the, the, the gold standard of, of sovereignty and, and freedom for you? I don't, I don't know if it exists for a, a human being and, and like, because then you choose sovereignty, it puts you at risk for so much. You, 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 you there's no see like then you choose to, um, but then you slide towards a slavery, the compensation that you get is, is an illusion of a safety and protection. It's always, I always look at things through a libertarian uh, perspective because that's where I developed a lot of my early ideas. And I always think that like the state offers you the illusion of safety through conformity and compliance. And as long as you do what the state recommends that you do and you, you follow their rules, nobody um, will will uh, come to try to hurt you or nobody will take away your stuff. They'll they'll leave you alone in peace for you to to watch Netflix and, you know, order Uber Eats and all that stuff that the, the, the that makes it seem like you're in control of your life. But to be truly on your own without, uh, without the state overlording you or without the illusion of a safety protecting you from things really puts you at risk for a lot of things. There's, there's, there's heavy danger. The, the idea that uh, freedom is not a free, I, I always ask when I go, is it free? I, I'll ask that question all the time. Like, is freedom free? And if it's not free, how much do you have to pay for it? How do you have to pay for it? What is the cost of it? And I think that the cost of a freedom is like danger, and it's the the constant threat of at a very basic level. Uh, uh, your life is at stake. If you're if you're living alone in the woods somewhere and you rely on nobody and nobody can control you, you have to feed yourself. There are no grocery stores for you to do anything. If you if you do not kill an animal or or uh, forage a uh, food somehow, you die. And so. The idea of absolute sovereignty, um, whether that even exists or not, is is a thing that I don't think everybody wants, or or a thing that I think everybody can even handle. We we, we want to be somewhere in the, the the middle where we we sacrifice some of our sovereignty for the convenience of not having to do everything ourselves and that's like like as a libertarian like i hear myself say that and i like immediately am like I'm resisting it immediately like i feel like oh no i want absolute sovereignty but i think if we're if we're honest with ourselves maybe not but i think in in a modern sense a sovereignty just means 
absolutely a minimal state interference at a very, very basic level is just, I want the government to be as, as, <laughs> as uninvolved in my life as a possible. And, and then you say that there are tr trade-offs and like libertarians, like like where the viewpoint on libertarianism begins to uh, fall apart is like, all right, well, who's going to take out your garbage? Who's going to pave the streets? It's, it's like we would, the idea of like, I'll do everything on my own all the time is, is, is a beautiful idea, but the re a reality of it, um, like your life is not as pr a productive as it is if you have s a, some help from some some government form, you know, some governance doing things for you. So it's like, do we want sovereignty? See, like you, you, you have to ask yourself these things and the, there's no answer to it. But there's only the exploration of the idea. Let me ask you, are there things in your life that you, you have that are, that, that are given to you by the state or that are governed for you that you actually get a value out of? Yeah, there are a lot of things. Uh, for example, the, the, the infrastructure, tra the transport infrastructure in Europe is really good. Uh, and it's mostly, uh, provided by uh, the state. I mean, who's the state? They are collecting taxes, they're deploying the taxes. Um, but there's like two different concepts for me. Like there's this, uh, it, you don't want the state to be involved, okay? Because you can also like hire private companies and they can maybe raise the, uh, and, and the, a private company make the tra public transport systems, the private companies make the uh, the garbage disposal and stuff like that. For example, like the garbage also is like some government thing, uh, at least here uh, in Austria. So um, there's no question about it. You always are depending on other people. That's like it. It comes. It comes down to that. I'm depending on other people. I'm depending on uh, my girlfriend not stabbing me in the back in the night. I'm depending on uh, when I'm sitting in a plane that the, the pilot is not crashing the plane. I'm always depending on other people and always trusting other people. So that concept of complete trustless, uh, like you can verify everything and you don't have to trust anyone. That's completely bullshit, I think, because you always have to trust other people. And that's not a bad thing. We should trust each other. Like we have a functioning society. We work together. We trust each other. Uh, and, and, and there's always like, even in that podcast is, is, is a trust in there. I trust you to, 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 to give your best, to, to speak the best and, and give the best content uh, here. You trust me to, present you then in, in the title in the thumbnail and everything the best way so like there's there's always a a, a trade-off and a trust involved and other people involved uh, no matter what we do uh the only question with libertarians i feel like the, there's the question like how much should we centralize organize with with taxes and and with with the government and and with democracy and then there's the whole libertarian view where like we don't need them. We can do everything privately because there will uh, be a hole in the market for someone to get the garbage off of the streets and, and people that live on those streets will pay for that. And they will like build some alliance and say like, Hey, I'm willing to pay like hundred euros per, per month to do uh, you to get the garbage out. And there will be a market for that. <clears throat> so I can see that there's then there also the other thing, like how do we solve, um, disputes? Because uh, if if uh, someone uh, screws me over, like, let's first put the, the podcast as an example. I uh, displace you uh, in that podcast completely, and and I do it in a in a way where it's actually really bad for for your reputation, or like I make make you in front of you or something like that. Uh, then you can basically um, uh, I don't know the English word for it, <laughs> but you can basically uh, um, get me in front of a judge and say like, hey. He should get the video off and he should pay a fine for that and stuff like that. There's a dispute. There's like two opinions on that. 
uh, and and there is someone in the middle of the state that has a monopoly on violence uh, that can actually add act on that. And he's like, no, uh, Robin, sorry, you're wrong. Take the video off and pay him uh, Eddie uh, a two thousand euro fine or something like that. Um, and yeah, I can and, say and, no. And, yeah. You know what? I think that that's where the the perspective really uh, falls apart it is in the the uh, punishment of crimes because everything is going to be uh, monetarily abased and and that's not enough of a penalty to to stop people from their uh, uh, behavior especially people who already do, don't have a uh, money the, the idea of of in imprisoning somebody if they behave a certain way is uh, is uh, the best d d d deterrent that we have for for uh, uh, criminal behavior. Unfortunately, it's it's ne never going to be a perfect system, but that's honestly it does work. You know, there are a lot of times when I would like to uh, inflict a violence on other people, but I don't because there's one thing that I think, you know, what would really suck is if I was in a prison and I, I have to, I have to weigh these things out and say like, is this fleeting a moment of anger a worth a few years of my life behind bars? And that's, I don't mind that structure for society. But there are there are certain things that the the libertarians nail on the head, and there are things that they just they that like they can't they can't solve for. And I think centralization is one of the biggest things because if you allow the free market to just be free, it eventually all leads to a centralized. A gigantism like these investment funds who own everything like we have essentially a free market in the United States it's free market but it's it's being manipulated um, and it's not free because obviously the, the money's not free but uh, uh, we have the illusion of a free market and under that illusion we see you know a uh, uh, a firm like a BlackRock just completely dominate everything. And I would be horrified if BlackRock owned the roads or if they owned the ocean or the lakes, the uh, water supplies, or if they owned all the desalinization plants. You know, they might actually, I don't know, but I would be I would be horrified if 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 the free market just allowed, you know eventually this consolidation into this centralized a uh, format of of everything and and um i think that you need some 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 form of governance to prevent that and there's a really interesting and, and important point in there uh because everything is good as long we as we have a choice like if if a company owns the one company owns the whole water supply, that's obviously really bad, because then we cannot choose uh, the 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 water freely. But if we have like oh there's like public water, there's like a private water, then I can buy water from here. I can freely choose uh, what water I, I get, and this this is with everything uh, in 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 our lives with everything that we we kind of do. We we want the choice like. In some sense, uh, I don't think we have a good competition in smartphones. Like there's Apple uh, and there's Google, and then there's a lot of nothing. Of obviously there are other people also, but Google and Apple kind of have like this two monopoly on that. But it's even good that we have at least two. Like there, it's really good that it's not just Apple because uh, when Apple screws something up, Google will point that out and do something in, in the other way around. So like kind of like Apple protects us that Google doesn't screw us over and Google protects us that Apple doesn't screw us over. It's not a perfect free market because we, we, I would prefer more major players. So like that's why I also like encourage, I would encourage Elon that actually do a Tesla phone. 
or an X phone or something like that. And other like we, we need competition in every sense. We need competition, especially in all those highly centralized place. I do do that podcast on YouTube. That YouTube is right now like the the TV of the internet. That those are where the long format videos are living. Uh, and it's kind of free, uh, but there's censoring going on. There's other things going on. So it would be great if t- Twitter is actually uh, in a place where they can get a competition on a long format video that w- they are trying but did not do it successfully till now. It would be great. Competition is always amazing because it forces everyone to be better. And that's like the, I think that's the libertarian view. We, we need a market that... Uh, allows uh, f- uh, allows free competition to arrive and and not have someone own everything. So that's why even a free market, a complete free market, I think needs some rules uh, and, and and maybe even rulers where we are like like even a football game. When you look at a football game, every player can do whatever they want in there, but there are certain rules they cannot do uh, in order so that uh, because like. <laughs> For example, let's let's imagine there is no rules in in soccer, uh, and the other team has a really good uh, scorer, and he's like just always making the goals. An easy thing to do is like, hey, the first time he comes on, just jump him really badly in there, and then he's out because he has to go to the hospital. That's not allowed because then when he does that, he gets a red card. And maybe it's like even uh, blocked a few games uh, from playing. And maybe even if it's really bad and, and we might get even like outside <laughs> of the football court uh, in the actual court problems if it's really a bad attack. Uh, but then it has to be really something major. So there, there are certain rules that make sense. But what I think is we got a little bit too many rules. We got a little bit <laughs> too, too much state involvement in, in the whole sense. But yeah, it, it's, a, it's an interesting question to think like, where where is freedom? Like, what is the definition of freedom? And how can we ensure that the individual is as free as possible uh, and uh, ensuring still a, a free market overall and not uh, pu- putting any constraints on anyone. That's like a really hard topic still for me. I'm like, I was in politics before. I'm not now. I'm in Bitcoin. I talk so much about freedom. It's just a, a topic that is also not really thought of in, in my head. If I had a fine answer for that, I probably had a book out of that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A freedom is, is an interesting one because I always hear it all the time, but I, but the, 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 there's no differentiation when people discuss it. it. There are really two freedoms. There's the freedom from, and there's the freedom t- to. These are two different concepts. A lot of people conflate them or whatever, but but you can have freedom from something and it feels a lot different th- than having the, the, the freedom to do something. And I think that, that that real freedom is freedom to. And freedom from is more like relief um, or it can also be disguised as escapism. A lot of people like, like I could have the freedom from paying my bills the, uh, I could have the the freedom from my responsibility. I could achieve that if I go out and I and I'm uh, with my friends and we're having a few drinks. And now for that time period, I'm free from the thoughts of responsibility. And it seems like I've achieved a level of a freedom there, but it's only an illusion. It's escapism. It's not actual. F- of freedom. I've only escaped it temporarily. And so now I'm, I'm somewhere else. My, my a mind is elsewhere and it's free from a thing, but I don't have the freedom to live my life without responsibility. I've only escaped it for a moment. And so when we understand that there's, there's a freedom from things and there's freedom to things, what we, what that humans want is freedom too. That's the the big thing. But we can't get that 
unless we have freedom from first. So like we need freedom from over over the restriction. We need freedom from people trying to uh, cause us harm. Like all of the, and like the, that comes in the form of a safety, right? With the, the the freedom too, and this goes back to to, to sovereignty. The, the freedom too allows us to be to put ourselves in in danger, to put ourselves at risk. We, then you start a business, let's say, in in a capitalistic society, you have the freedom to put yourself at risk to the point where the that business could fail, and you, and the the freedom to do that only comes when there's a freedom from the, res the restriction of it. So it's like you have these two ends of it and they're, they're always at play with each other and they're always involved. But like, I ask myself that all the time, you know, freedom from or freedom to. And I, I, I think it goes back to how we d d define a, a freedom. I remember, Larry Cardone was on, and I love that episode. That was the uh, first episode that I listened, and um, I was like, "This is awesome!" And um, and like he talked about a freedom a lot, but I think what he was talking about was really independence. He was saying that he wants the freedom to say no to people, or the freedom to say yes to people. You know, the freedom to do that he wants essentially and to, to uh, choose these things i look at that as more independence i think i think freedom is all about a time like that that escapism seems like freedom because for for that time period you you feel free and so i think i think freedom is all about the ability to be a present in the moment in the days and what you're doing fully without this i have to wake up in the morning i have to go to work i have this obligation in the future real real freedom is to just be be a present and to be at one with what with that's happening around you that's like the real of uh, freedom from and freedom to combine. Thank you. You already made it halfway through the video and I'm really, really grateful to have you here. Two things make this channel possible. You as a watcher and listener who keep supporting this channel. And another one is all the Bitcoin brands that I partner up with, like 21Bitcoin, who support me from the very start and where I personally buy my Bitcoin from. With Code Robin, you even get a discount when you buy Bitcoin with them. And now also Bitbox. Bitbox is the simplest and securest way to secure your Bitcoin. And I heard a crazy statistics. Only 2% of Bitcoiners hold their Bitcoin in a hardware wallet. How crazy is that? Don't be in that 98% bracket. Be in the 2% bracket. And if you have self-custody and you know your friend does not have, maybe he needs a Christmas present. Maybe he needs a birthday present. And a small life hack, if you use code ROBIN, you get 5% off your order, plus you support my channel. And now let's get back to the video. Yeah, I also love the, the episode with Gary a lot. Uh, it's still also my most successful episode. Uh, um, probably Michael Saylor will, will, <laughs> will crush him, but uh, but till now it's still the most uh, watched episode. Um, that's such a uh, unique perspective. For, for example, I never heard that freedom from and freedom to uh, uh, aspect to it. Like I have to re-watch that when, when I'm adding that because I, I don't think I, I understood it fully. You did a great job in explaining it, but it's a, a new concept for me. And so it's really, uh, it, it could be really profound. Uh, it's also like, I, I never shared on other podcasts, but often the guest says something and I'm like, oh, that's something completely new. Uh, and, and I don't fully grasp it. And then I edit it and I'm like, oh shit, that's like, that's actually profound. And I actually, I just understand it because like, when you have to podcast you and you're the interviewer, the host, you're always like you're listening, but you're always like trying to like, okay, where we can come with the conversation. So 
uh, the, 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 the listening is better. If you can actually just focus on the listening, I'm trying to get better uh, in this skill. And then I, I notice that it gets better with every episode I do. So I can listen, actually grasp what you're saying and lead the conversation, which is like a, a lot of doing at one. And I hope, uh, I hope I do a good job in that. Uh, but when we talk about the, those freedoms and the whole concept that, that you now described, do you think that Bitcoin leads us uh, to a world that looks more like that? I hope so. It can, you know, I think that that's, that's obviously what all of us would hope for. You know, I, I, I love Bitcoin. I wear this hat every day in hopes that somebody uh, uh, sees it and asks me about it. And every now and then I, 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 that the opportunity to orange pill somebody or, or I try to at least, and, you know, I'm like a 5% success rate with it, but also there's, there's always a learning curve to it. But I, I also have to, to uh, view things from a realistic perspective too. And I, I ask myself things like, like what are the ch choke points of this, you know? And I, I, I always like to, I'm afraid of the ETF more than anything else. I'm afraid of the, the, there being a large enough uh, percentage of the supplies stuck in there that it essentially renders it a useless for anybody as a, a medium of exchange. It's, it's portability is, of reduced through the ATF. And that's why I don't view, I view the ETF version of Bitcoin as less of a, a valuable than the, the self custody version of it, because the, the a portability aspect of it is uh, taken away. And I think, I think that, I think that uh, the people investing in the ETF don't understand that. And they're, they don't understand that, that, that they're not actually holding, they're not actually um, in the custody of the full value of, of the technology. And that they, they give it away voluntarily. And so I'm, I'm afraid of, of, of large scale adoption into the ATFs prior to this understanding that everybody has when, we, when then we talk about self custody. So, I mean, I, you know, we, we get to, to talk all day about, about if it's going to be, um, the, a medium of exchange for the world someday. I know that's, that, that's a big thing. It has to become a store of value first. I, we, 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 they already tried it as a medium of exchange of first and, 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 and it, it doesn't work unless the, the value is completely stabilized first. And I, th I think after that happens though, medium of exchange, uh, global monetary system for everybody to use and free and available and accessible and 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 uh like all of the beautiful philosophical things that we talk about all day long about that happens when when the the, the, the world's money is a uh, free i think it happens super fast because the incentives to, to, to use this thing that everybody has already as money will be so high and so valuable that whoever can produce a product like that, like lightning, which, you know, but the, the aspect of it being on a medium of exchange will be too valuable for it not to happen. So store a value first, everybody has this thing and everybody understands it and then it just naturally 
becomes a, a, a money then, naturally. I, I, I love your few bands a lot, uh, and I, I like how you how you how you have a based view on, on the stuff. And and for the, the ETF stuff is really interesting. Uh, I mean, they're like the the one side too is like that says no, it's it's never a, a, um, a threat because it's just the, the supply of it, and it cannot really do anything with Bitcoin. But if you have a lot of Bitcoin, uh, then you can do stuff with it. I personally, right now, don't see it as a threat. Uh, but I see a path where when they get a major stake in Bitcoin, which you don't have till now, a really a major stake, um, then it, I could imagine it being a threat. Uh, but also at the other point is like when Bitcoin is actually the sound money that we think it is, then it has to withstand that. If, if an ETF corrupts Bitcoin, then Bitcoin was never the sound money that we thought it is. That's the beauty of it. Like if real sound money, it doesn't matter what anyone does with it. It withstands any attack from anybody. And Bitcoin already withstand really big attacks. I think back of the block size war. I think back of, of even uh, Elon Musk tested it kind of like I see Elon Musk, what he did as an a tried attack. He was the richest man alive at this point. I think he, he still is. Uh, and he really like adopted it and then trashed on it. Uh, and what happened? Like the price was at X, then it got 2X, and then it went back to X. Like it had like no effects on, on Elon Musk. Of course, he crashed it, but first he also drove it up. So <laughs> uh, so the, 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 the more people that come in Bitcoin, the more attacks it gets, the bigger it also gets, and the more resilient it gets. And if Bitcoin is actually the sound money that it is, and I believe it is, I could be wrong, like future and history will tell me, uh, then uh, Bitcoin will, will withstand any attack, even Black Rocks and ETFs attacks. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. And I made, uh, we, we discuss, I had discuss, discussed that with uh, Michael Saylor because that question came up a lot. Oh, is ETFs a, a threat? And he said something interesting that I don't know if it's entirely true. I, I don't know if I stand behind that opinion, but it's an interesting viewpoint. He said like the ETFs is a further decentralization of Bitcoin. It's another player in the game. Uh, and uh, he also described like when MicroStrategy came in and when other people that came in, uh, when all of a sudden El Salvador comes in, now BlackRock comes in and, and then there's another player coming in. Like every player... Uh, pulls in one direction uh, and the players are getting more and more decentralized and more and more uh, influential also uh, when we come to this point like nobody can change Bitcoin because there are too many influential people and too many sides rubbing on each other uh, and it's that kind of this thing like in the middle and it's really stable I, I love that view Brandon how do you how do you feel it uh, how, do you can you also see the argument there's like it might be even like a decentralization of that uh, and and i mean yeah it definitely could also be a threat like i i definitely see that also yeah well i think i mean i just like to be aware of the potential for it to go bad and i also think like the like we're uh, moving away from uh, uh, people like individuals or or, or even nations uh, being able to um, affect it uh, negatively, you know, it's like we're we're we, we've sort of escaped the a meme episode of where you know somebody can say something and then oh no, that's that one is zero because that guy said so and so i have to sell all my bitcoin now i think we've escaped that but that was that was the re a reality for a few years there you know if 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 you heard something from a prominent voice that was negative about it the a price went down all the time now you know i don't really see that being a problem anymore now the the, the threat is going to be from government a regulation which as of now it's, it seems to be on 
our side with it, you know, but, um, yeah, the, ex uh, the executive order 6102 is nothing that could really not have like that, that could, it could be reality. Like when the fiat currency are getting more and more unstable and more and more to a crashing scenario. Uh, and then the state is seeing, oh, there's all those Bitcoins in all those ETFs and Bitcoin has actual value and actually drives up. Uh, and we could use those Bitcoin to stabilize the US dollar, stabilize fiat currencies. Um, it's something where right now I cannot imagine it, but it's not impossible for the future. Uh, but it, it, it will be really interesting, uh, the, the future of Bitcoin. Yeah? Have you considered how the ETFs might uh, fail as a, a financial instrument? You mean when uh, the price does not run up in like the one in one year and, and then the clients are uh, upset or? I just mean when the, the ETFs themselves go to zero. Have oh. You <laughs> considered a pathway for that yet? Because uh, no, I, I see don't. it. Well, well, did you trade your Bitcoin right now for an equal amount in the ETF? Uh, not at all. Like I, I don't want ETFs. <laughs> did you trade your Bitcoin right now for two times the amount of it in ETFs? I mean, if I have the chance to trade it back like 10 minutes after that. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> No, you no, but uh, have to hold it for a year after that. Then it's hard because, um, like, first of all, why would they offer me that? Like, the, I would be very suspicious. Suspicious. Why would someone offer me that? But even if that side is not the case, mm -hmm. uh, do I trust them enough to don't fuck up a year? Because I might get doubled, but I might also get nothing, uh, and there can something happen. Uh, I mean, that is really hard to say. I think um, Bitcoin grows itself really into the system where it might get to a stage where even when Coinbase gets hacked and there's some Bitcoin stolen, there might be even the case where like the government steps in and says like, oh, there are so many, there, there's the ETF. Like, we're not at this stage right now, but we could be at this stage where we're like, oh, no, 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 that, that would be too detrimental to the to the system, we need to support the Bitcoin ETFs. Like that would be an, uh, that would be a meme in itself, but I would never trade for any price, uh, my Bitcoin, because first of all, I'm satisfied with my stack. It's never enough, but I'm satisfied with it. So I'm like, Oh, I, I want to gamble it. And I want to get more because I could also do the same with shit coins. Like I, I'm in a unique perspective. Uh, where I see shit coins when they get promoted early on. I see it in my comments with the bots and everything. Uh, I always see that I sometimes even watch it when there's a new shit coin coming out. I see like, oh, it's now at that price. And then a few weeks back when they really roll on the marketing machines and the bots machines, they're like, oh, it's like 10x that, uh, even like 50x that. So like, I definitely could make money with shit coins and trading, especially with my uh, channels. Uh, I see it really early on when they start marketing and then, but I am just not interested in that. <laughs> I'm really not. Uh, so there are a lot of possibilities for me to enhance my Bitcoin stack, but I have peace with it. I have my Bitcoin stack and I love what I do. And that thing that I do enhances my Bitcoin stack. And mm. I'm satisfied with the pace of it. I'm satisfied with yeah. my stack. I'm satisfied with the pace of increasing that stake and I can wake up every day and do what I love. Like I don't need a shortcut. I'm already there where I want to be. And, and that's the beautiful thing when you are all of a sudden happy with your situation, happy with your life and happy where you are, you're not, uh, you're not, uh, that easily persuaded, uh, to shitty situations that might look like a good situation, but easy situations. Like even, uh, I talked with a lot of people on, on that stuff, like a lot of winners often, I don't like, I, when I see someone like, Oh, he wins the lottery. I'm like, ah, 
let's see how he does in two years because mm -hmm. he gets a crazy high and most cannot resist to actually like don't also spend their Bitcoin or not spend their lottery win. And then they get even to a lower, lower uh, uh, point than they were before because they spend all their money and they had all those new friends and all those things that come with that wealth. But at some point it will run out if you don't make more money. That's why I'm a really big proponent of, yes, it's okay if you get wealthy. Yes, it's, it's amazing if you get wealthy into a, a good state, but it's perfect. It's, it's best if you get it organically. That's why I also have a lot of comp compassion with people that inherit a lot of wealth because they did not do it on, the, uh, on themselves. Uh, they might have knowledge about it, but they always have this, this thing on their shoulders like, my dad did it. And they hear that a lot. Like, uh, and they, even if they don't hear it, they feel it that the other person is like, uh, yeah, but you inherited your wealth. You inherited that company. That's why you are successful. So like, I have a lot of, comp like I have a friend of mine where the dad is really successful. Uh, and I have been with like him, like since like a, a small boy. And I know how much he struggles because of his shadow of the big dad. Uh, mm -hmm. And so like, I, I don't know where, why I went in this road now, but uh, <laughs> I, I just like, uh, uh, I forgot even where I started right now, but it's like, you ha have to have a lot of compassion with, with, with those people. And, and yeah, I completely forgot my, my where yeah, I okay. came from that. <laughs> it's okay. I, I, I think for the uh, uh, first time, I think you're having a conversation with somebody more than you're interviewing them. And so the, the idea of you just not thinking about what the next question is allows you to sort of explore yourself. So here, here, right? Here's an awesome example of this. You, when you interview somebody, you don't have the freedom to ramble because you're not free from the idea of I'm on a podcast, I'm interviewing somebody. This conversation somehow freed you from the responsibility of being the interviewer and gave you freedom to speak freely and to just explore ideas more. And, and you, you, you lost, you, you lost the taste of the interview, but not the conversation. Now we're just having an organic conversation. You're free in that moment now. And that's what the, that's what freedom is, is it not have to worry about, I can't sway too far this way because it, I don't want to forget we, we were talking about the ATFs. That's what we were talking about, by the way. And and then it just it just moved in that direction. Freedom to and freedom from. Now I let me go back a little bit because I because what, that you said about uh, trading your Bitcoin. I think it was so it was so uh, simple, but yet profound that you are satisfied with your stack. And you currently have the freedom to do anything you want with your stack, right? Because you, you're holding it. As soon as you trade it for an ATF, you no longer have the freedom to do whatever you want with it. You have the freedom from the responsibility of testing it. You have the, um, I, I suppose that's really it, but like, but you lose the freedom to use it however you want, uh, freely, to tr transfer it to people or to, to invest with it. They have to sell it. That's the only way to, to use it then. I think that like, I think that your, the freedom that you have in holding your stack and being able to that up and do YouTube and all this stuff, the freedom to it's, it's free of uh, uh, money in the, this regard. And the ETF doesn't represent that. That's a, that's a profound thought. I love it. And I, you're right. I like there are um, most of my interviews. I'm in the interview mode. Like I try to get the best out of the, the guest. There's some instances uh, that I already had those those experiences where like it was more like a conversation. It's also I try to 
less and less prepare for those interviews because mm -hmm. I saw that when I'm over prepared, it's not as good. Like it's better when I'm a little bit under prepared uh, and I'm a little bit more with the guest and less with my preparation with topics and, and things I want to get into. Um, and there's a, obviously a healthy balance to it because I think, I think if you show up always unprepared, um, you might miss a good chance. Like, oh, that's what we can speak about. Oh, like, because often in the, the preparation phase, I, f I see topics that are really interesting and then I can start at an interesting point. Uh, and it sometimes de deletes that um, warming up phase. You're like, oh, what are you doing? And, and getting into that conversation. So it could accelerate the conversation to be faster, interesting. But it takes away from the organic development from a normal conversation. Uh, and I'm aware of that. So I have no, like, yeah. for example, that's why Joe Rogan does it so long. Mm -hmm. Because he all, like, I think Joe Rogan does not really prepare. I don't know. I never researched if he, if he does or if he spoke about that publicly, but I think Joe Rogan is just like, oh, let's, let's sit down with him and has, have a conversation. And I also noticed that I do it usually one hour. We are now already at one hour 10, uh, but uh, I usually do like one hour, one and a half hours on the podcast. And I noticed that like the last half hour of the podcast is better than the first half hour of the podcast because you have to warm up. I've never seen you before. I have 99% yeah. of my guests I've never seen before uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a good sense. Some of my guests, uh, like I had yesterday, the first time ever I had a guest on twice. So that was already way better. Uh, and it was amazing because it also, also was in person. It's also a different feeling. But yeah, that's kind of what I uh, wanted to add here. Uh, yeah, I like, you know what? Let's like, I wasn't... Uh, prepared uh, for any of this. I've obviously never done a podcast before. Um, I'm not a big a social media guy. I've never, uh, this is probably my like third or fourth uh, video call. Like I'm not used to like, I don't know where to, to look exactly like all that, you know, I'm just, uh, I'm just like, I'm, I'm just like a blue collar machine operator who leaves comments on uh, YouTube and now I'm talking to you. And so I've had some uh, uh, moments here where I was like, what am I talking about? I'm not making sense anymore. I'm like, am I still making sense? And, you know, and a lot of it's because I've only thought about this stuff in my head. I've never really uh, verbalized any of it. So it's like, I can write it down as a, a way to really I'll lock it in. But if I, I haven't done that yet and I've never discussed it with somebody else, this is like, this is like as raw as it gets is me just uh, figuring things out. And like, that's what conversations are for. And we can ask each other things and go you know, back and forth. And like having somebody there to, to call you out or to be like, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense. Or like, I'm not really sure where you're going with that. That's why we 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 really had these conversations to really clarify things. I think in in my own mind, before this happened, I thought I was going to come on and like express my views. I was going to come on and say like I've got all of this stuff I've figured out, and now I'm going to express it so other people can 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 assimilate it themselves but the reality is I, I i don't have it all figured out i have very little of it figured out all i do is ask myself things all day long and i ask other people things all day long and i've i've, I've enjoyed the, the conversation because it's been so organic and because i felt a free within this conversation to just be myself and to just not not have the fear of my ego thinking like oh if i don't express the these points the way that Jeff Booth does, uh, nobody's going to care or nobody's going to like this or uh, Robin's not going to like it. Robin's not going to uh, post it. All that stuff. I I've been free of th those thoughts. I've just been, been able to enjoy this moment with you. And I think that like, like having, having moments like this it is uh, so rare. And I think that I, I wanted to, to, 
to tell you this for a, a, a long time. You doing a podcast every day for as long as you have is is such a a monumental amb ambition and a pulling it off it seems impossible and yet you make it look so easy i don't think people understand like how hard it is to to actually like have a podcast every day it, it, it would be hard to have an hour long conversation with a family member in your own home every day for a, a lot of people. You, you have hour long conversations with people you've never met, people you don't know anything about, people you've never even interacted with before, and you do it every day and you do it consistently. That's why I left the comments that I left because I saw this guy is going so hard. He deserves the uh, the 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 algorithm bumper. He deserves me me also contributing. You inspired me to add more because I see how much you've you've put into it. I just want to say, like, uh, more than anything else, I appreciate seeing somebody who says, "I'm going to do this thing," and then execute it every single day. I, I'm literally having goosebumps right now. Thank you. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, it's it's actually, um, I would not say hard, uh, but it's, uh, you, you learn to adapt because there's so many different people and everyone has a different energy. And like some someone comes in, like for example, Natalie Brunel uh, and Jeff Booth is like always two, the two examples I use because everyone knows those two. And Natalie Brunel is used to like really speaking like a machine gun because she speaks on television a lot. She always has like two minutes time to express herself and she's on the special like they're CNBC and they want to have now an opinion on that specific topic. What will Bitcoin do? And she has one minute time. Uh, and she's like, I, I asked her questions. She's like, and I feel like, <laughs> <laughs> like I, I feel like shot from a machine gun. Uh, and then there's the Jeff Booth kind of a guy, like he's uh, sitting back, relax, and and really takes his time with the words, and then like really like explains it, and and it's like that it's a calm moment uh, with him. It's like those completely different persons and there are 25 different uh, per uh, categories of persons and maybe like, that are on my podcast and there's probably like thousands of others that have not been interviewing and people are like oh it's crazy that you do it uh, every day and I'm like I want to do it every day twice like I, I enjoy it so much at this point <laughs> and the only thing I do in, don't do it more is because uh, I have constraints with the uh, uh, post-production I like once we have done with the podcast I have to figure out how to uh, market that whole thing uh, what to do in the description what to do in the title thumbnail uh, there's a lot to do it then I get all the quotes out of the podcast uh, and I have to put it on all the platforms like there's a lot of uh, around things like I spend with you like one, two hours recording it. Uh, and then I spend another two, three, sometimes four hours of, of post-production, uh, work. And so that's, that's the challenge. Uh, the, the conversations, I always enjoyed them. I always was like, uh, a very talkative person. I, I was not always that, uh, uh, I was since like 15, 16, 17 years old, I, I became that person a little bit because I pushed myself out of the comfort zone. Uh, but I'm still really introverted. Uh, you would not guess it. Uh, and, uh, but if I feel comfortable, then I'm getting to like, a really, uh, extroverted. Like I, if I'm in a party with like 10 people, I really like, I'm the guy that always screams. I'm the guy that always talks, talks the whole night. I'm really extroverted. Now, if I'm with a new crowd, I'm more listening. I'm really more introverted. I think probably a lot of people uh, feel that way. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's. It's fascinating to have the podcast every day, and uh, thank you for the feedback. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, well, yeah. Soon, uh, soon enough, you're going to have a a production team. You're going to have a post production team. You're going to have somebody to a uh, book people. You'll be uh, paying people to do all the things that are the 
the constraints of, for you and you, you will be free to just have conversations. You'll be free I mean, from the, the effort of the constraints around the, the conversations and mm -hmm. are free to just talk to people all day long. And the only thing that I never want to outsource is guest booking, like uh, having um, making the appointments with guests because I feel like it's, first of all, you know it, I do it always with a calendar link. I send a calendar link out and then you book it. Uh, but I think it's not a good thing to like the assistants writes, hey, do that and that. There are so many tools that do a good job that we don't have to write back and forth with time zones and everything. So. I, the guest booking is the one thing that I'm like, that's the, that's the connection that I want to keep it. But all that rest, like the post-production, <laughs> how the trader looks, uh, what quotes to take from that. I think it, it would even elevate the, the quality because then there's a guy that does full time, uh, on how to make the video, the, the conversation that is there, because after the conversation is done, I can do a better job in the conversation, but I can do a better job in uh, editing it. I can do like a one minute uh, preview that people actually have a nice idea what is in the conversation. And then also inside of it, uh, I can capture like when you say something, then the camera cuts to like my uh, um, reaction because maybe my reaction is in that moment more interesting and that having you on full focus, like those kind of a things, like all this I cannot do this now because I don't just don't have the time to do it all the time. But there are a lot of things that would uh, my podcast would benefit from once I have an, another person helping me. But How yeah, long do you think uh, you're, you're away from that? No clue. Um, like I see uh, my podcast is related uh, to the Bitcoin price. Like I see when the Bitcoin price is going up and down. Either way, it, if it goes up or down, it doesn't matter for me. Uh, but it, if it does, if the Bitcoin price does something, I get way more views, and with way more views, more people see it, uh, and uh, I make also more money. For example, I made more money when I had a thousand subscribers uh, because the views and, and were up, and the, the, the volatility of Bitcoin were up. Then I make right now because the price has been like so flatlining for a, a, a longer time. Uh, so for example, if, if the Bitcoin price shoots up in the Q3, Q, Q4, it could be extremely interesting how then my podcast starts because I leveled up my quality, leveled up the library, leveled up with my guests, and then the price also comes in, then I don't know what's possible. But yeah, I'm just trying to do a, a, a great job and enhancing the quality, enhancing everything around that. And if I'm able to in, employ a person to help me, it uh, depends on the output uh, that, uh, that I get. I can only control the input and, and I will put the input in as long as I live. I, I already said in the podcast, I will do the podcast till I die uh, because I love it. Uh, if I cannot do it uh, as a profession at some point because of whatever reason, I will just do it once a week and, and do uh, less of them because then I'm time constrained. But I would love to do it as, as much as I, as I do it. So I will, I will always do it <laughs> at least, at least once a week. That's interesting because I don't think we've ever had, uh, they haven't had a podcaster uh, do their whole life through the, the their podcast yet. Like I, I know uh, Rogan is like a 55 right now. I always ask myself like, is he still gonna be doing this when he's like 75? When... Yeah, and, and, and he does it since a long time. He does it 15 years already. Yeah. And he has started in 15 years and on average 3.4 episodes per week. So he's done a lot of episodes. Uh, but yeah, it would be really interesting to see like I started 25 and I'm doing like till 95, but yeah, I also have to do it. Let's see uh, <laughs> if I actually uh, can hold my, my word. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 it's fine. I'm, I'm excited to see what happens. I think the results are so new. Podcasting as a career is, is new. 
we, you know, uh, 20 years ago, the, there weren't any uh, career podcasting jobs, you know, but, but, but now it seems like it could be a lifelong career for, for, uh, for people who do it at a high level. And I'm just, I'm uh, curious to see what happens with that. Curious to see old men podcasting more than anything, I think. Uh, yes. I also think that elderly people, like I'm talking like 65, 70, 80 years old, even, I think they should get more in front of camera and speak because they have such like, I'm 25 year old. My, I have not lived anything like I've lived something, but compared to an 80 year old man, I've not done any experience at this point. Like they have so much more experience. They have so much more wisdom. So for them to do a podcast, that would be great. And I would love to see that. Uh, and it's also interesting. I, I've, I see the, the, the statistics, how old my uh, viewers are. And I actually have 12% of my viewers of 65 uh, and plus, like six, oh. 65 years old. And above that, uh, 12% of my viewers, which is amazing that they are like open and listening regularly to like a 25 year old guy that just starts out and have no clue about the life. <laughs> yeah, I think those are the early adopters for sure. Those are the open minded older people who who have always thought that they could learn from everybody. That's for sure. That's for sure. Um, as we're now at uh, already uh, more of the, the, the record uh, re record <laughs> timing in the podcast. I think I have done one podcast that was over two hours. Uh, it was a very long podcast. Um, let's come to the end routine. There's, the end routine is now uh, consisting of two questions. The first question is like, what are you currently passionate about besides Bitcoin? Besides Bitcoin, uh, what are you deeply learning and, and passionate about? You know what it is? It's uh, so weird because I've never been a frugal individual. I've always sort of just I've I've always made a, a not always, but for about the, the, the 10 years, I've had a, a, a somewhat high income um, and I've been able to just kind of like uh, afford things. And I never really thought about a budgeting before. I would just sort of like lived my life and thought whatever I, wa I wanted and, you know, tried to save money and tried to invest some things on the side. But I think since I got like really into Bitcoin, I've become so a frugal and so a, min a, a minimalistic. And I've really like asked myself all the time, is this valuable? Is this a thing that I need right now? And, 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 uh, I've just really, uh, I know it sounds, I know, maybe it sounds kind of a lame, but like, I'm passionate about not throwing value away on nonsense. And I've really become very a frugal and I'm minimalistic. And as a result, I've just been, I've just been backing sats man and that's where my real passion is right now i love it so much uh and we also have the end routine where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest without knowing who the next guest is uh and the the uh, it's a it's a profound question where we can like literally talk uh an hour more but uh, <laughs> why why is bitcoin uh creating a better world oh that's so, you know, that's not fair to ask, to ask that question at the end of the podcast. <laughs> we could go for another hour and a half e easily. Why is it creating a better world? V uh, very simply, because it, it uh, forces honesty. Forces integrity, honesty, because it's uh, a truth, uh, it's truth money. I have heard that yeah. uh, uh, expression out a lot. It's, it's, it's a, it's a great answer. Yeah. And it's, it's also great because I think actually we could make a whole podcast around that topic. So I think we, we should keep it as short as, as, as it is now. Uh, I perfect. Tried. And, uh, <laughs> per yeah, per perfect. And thank you, Eddie, for, for being on, um, before I let you go, uh, where can people like find you and ask questions? Do you have like an, an, an handle or somewhere where people can reach you? 
no, I'm not available. <laughs> I might be in your uh, YouTube comments, but that's about it. Perfect. And uh, when people want to to ask you questions, they should see my videos uh, and and see in the comments if there is uh, as someone beef in there. <laughs> I'll be I'm lurking around the the comments and uh, as I always am. Perfect. Then yeah, thank you. Uh, and I definitely I think if if people want to ask you questions, if people want to do that, they can do it in this podcast in that comment section. And I guess you will be in the in the comment section and 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 uh, answering questions if someone actually has uh, questions in there for you. And that's I think it's a, it's a good good way to to do that. And yeah, thank you for being on, and thank you everyone for watching. I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye bye.